Welcome in, listener. You're listening to a segment from the Slump Buster podcast with Juju and Dre. Find the full episode on Spotify, iTunes, the Google Play Store, or our YouTube channel. Enjoy. You know, my partner here, he's been chomping at the bits to talk about this big fight night that took place on Saturday. UFC 241, we had some big fights. Y'all Costa, Diaz Perez, and of course, DC versus Stipe. Andre, why don't you take this conversation away? Tell us about UFC 241. Yeah, definitely. So I want to start by saying, personally, I like individual sports the most, right? Because it's an individual versus another individual. You can't blame anybody. You can't say, oh, you know, our team didn't win because uh, so-and-so dropped the ball or or didn't pull their weight. So I love the UFC. It's probably my favorite go-to sport. So to get started, we'll take a look at Yoel Romero versus Paulo Costa first. So overall, I thought this was the best fight of the night, at least most exciting, most action. Even though it didn't necessarily end in a finish, right, a submission or a knockout, there was a whole lot of back and forth. Both guys got a knockdown early in round one. Tons of action all the way through the second and third rounds. But ultimately, Paulo Costa pulled it out, ended up getting the unanimous decision. And a few, like, the main things that I saw, unfortunately, it looks like Yoel Romero getting into his 40s is starting to lose a step. So he's not as explosive as he used to be. A lot of his go-to moves, right, he has a signature inside trip that he does. He only was able to land it once, and even then couldn't keep Costa down. And and part of it may be Costa's just a gigantic, you know, specimen of a human being. But normally, Romero is able to to capitalize on those situations. So, unfortunately, I think Yoel's time is, is sort of coming to an end. He's been fun to have around. Definitely one of the most exciting fighters in recent years. But I think age is finally catching up to him. Well, I mean, we talked about Tom Brady and Drew Brees slowing down in their 40s, and certainly quarterback in the NFL is a little less physically demanding than being locked in one-on-one in an MMA fight. So you could definitely understand why Romero starting to drop off in these later years. Tell me about Nate Diaz versus Anthony Pettis. This is Diaz's first fight since 2016, Conor McGregor 2. Yeah, so his first fight back definitely started, I guess, a little bit slow. So to me, at least in my opinion, Pettis looked better on the feet, so... His striking looked a lot crisper, a lot cleaner. He was getting the better of Diaz in the exchanges. But Diaz has this style where he never stops, right? So I don't know, maybe the dude's like immune to concussions or something. But I swear he got hit in the face like a million times and still kept moving forward. And where he was really able to succeed is on some poor sort of wrestling exchanges with Anthony Pettis. So as soon as he got Anthony Pettis to the ground is where Diaz really started to have success, and he really started to open up a lot of his significant strikes. That's where it all came from. The other thing that was kind of interesting, so I hear Pettis broke his foot. I'd have to go back and rewatch to see exactly where that happened, but he did start to to slow down a little bit, maybe towards the second and third. I think the biggest thing, though, is is Diaz has sort of played his card right. So he's always been bigger than Connor, right? Obviously, he beat Connor in one fight, lost to him the next, so his some people think it's a little bit controversial. And then Pettis has traditionally, you know, fought at 145, 155, and had to go, you know, to, to 165, 170 to fight this fight. And so you could definitely tell that Diaz was bigger. But Diaz plays his cards right. He knows how to get the win. He used a lot of his length to help him in those wrestling exchanges. And like I said, he just keeps coming forward. It's hard to, hard to knock him down. Well, what do you think about Diaz's next steps after this? So many people are connecting him to Conor McGregor for a third fight. We talked about the legal issues that Conor is dealing with right now and how that's probably lost a little steam being that it's 2019. Their last fight was 2016. Not a huge math expert here, but three years is forever in today's 24-hour news cycle. Now you have Nate Diaz. It seems like he's already moving on himself. We talked about facing Masvidal in his next fight. And Masvidal seems like he's game. He accepted this challenge just yesterday on the 20th. Yeah, so to me, it's kind of interesting. So Nate Diaz, if you look at it, historically, he's never been an elite fighter, right? I don't think he does anything exceptionally well. Like, he's he's a decent striker. He is dangerous on his feet. He's not a very good takedown artist, so he's not the best wrestler. And you can take him down. And his jits is pretty good, right? It's, it's better than your average jiu-jitsu in the UFC. But I wouldn't say it's elite by any means. Like, he's not a Damian Maya or something like that. But Conor McGregor and his fight with Conor McGregor sort of cemented him as sort of this cult hero, right? So now he has this big cult following, a ton of fans, which a guy that's 20 and 11 usually does not have the following that Nate Diaz has. And even Dana White came out and said, 
A, Nate Diaz is a needle mover now. You know, he can actually sell pay-per-views. So if I'm Nate Diaz, I'm trying to capitalize on that as quick as possible. So whatever my next big money fight is, Jorge Masvidal right now, as well as sort of at an all-time high, coming off his knockout of Ben Askren, right? So Ben Askren has been talking himself up ever since he came into the UFC. He beat Lawler on a sort of contentious submission, right? A lot of people didn't think that Lawler tapped, right? They thought it was, it was an early call. And so a lot of people thought Ben Askren was going to be around for a while. He was up until that point undefeated. And then Masvidal comes and knocks him out. So right now you have those two guys that are at their all-time high in popularity. Masvidal being a lot more explosive and electric fun to watch. Whereas Diaz, people like him for his trash talk. People like him just for his attitude that, you know, stock and slap he's always doing. So I do think that's, that's a good business move probably for both of them. The other options, I mean, Diaz should probably try to try to capitalize by getting a title fight if he can. I think now that he's in the top 10 of his, of his division, it might be the best time, you know, for him to, to jump in line to get that title shot, to try to get that payday. And then the Conor McGregor fight, I mean, I think it would still sell, but I personally don't know if Conor ever comes back. Dude's made millions of dollars, and now he's getting fights, you know, with old dudes at bars. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm punching old dudes because they won't drink his. But it's an Irish drink. bar, so they're like 20 here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if we ever see Connor back in the UFC, but I think well, it's good. Mentioned it last week. At this point, it's more like Connor is more of a sideshow attraction than he is really a fighter. I mean, it would be interesting to see him go against Diaz a third fight. Does but does Connor want to risk losing another fight to Diaz? I, I don't think so. That's yeah. Exactly. And Connor's, Connor's wealth, right, and legacy has been built up on, hey, I'm this, you know, exciting fighter. And it, at, for a while, it seemed that I was untouchable, right? He runs his mouth. But he lost to Floyd Mayweather in a boxing fight. Now, a lot of people can say, hey, you know, he's not a boxer. At least he stepped in there. Okay, granted. He's also lost to Nate Diaz recently. And then Connor McGregor's last fight, right, with Khabib, he got destroyed. And, and so Conor McGregor can't really risk losing another fight, at least popularity wise. I don't think he can, right? Cause it's hard to promote somebody that has lost four fights probably in his last five. The other question would be which weight class do they fight at? Mm -hmm. You know, Diaz is obviously bigger than McGregor. They fought at Diaz's weight class. They dropped down to Conor's. Where would they fight this third fight at? Yeah. And, and so I think there has been times where they've done, a catch weight, right, where they, they've met in the middle, and sometimes they do that. Though, I don't know who has more leverage right now as far as a negotiating standpoint. I think a lot of people want to see Connor, but at the same time, uh, Dana White, like I said, said Diaz is a needle mover, so Diaz might be able to say, nope, he has to come up and fight me, especially Connor doesn't have a belt anymore, right? So, Yeah, and I do think, too, that there is a bit of a contrast with how they're marketing some of the – marketing Diaz and McGregor – so right now they're marketing Diaz as a bit of an anti-hero and McGregor kind of has had that moniker for a long time too. Like even though he's been a bit of a jerk, a bit of a hothead, he still is a fan favorite. So in a way, an anti-hero in his own right. So mm -hmm. it, at this point too, I don't know how you really go about marketing that fight, who you portray as the villain, the hero, et cetera, et cetera. Let's oh, move back to the main event here. Okay. Uh, so you had Daniel Cormier versus Steve Miocic. Um, now you had, now this was a bit of an interesting fight. So Miocic has been trying to get this fight for over a year, get his rematch with DC, BBM father in the meantime. And you could tell in that early round, there's a lot of filling each other out. There was a lot of, a lot more patience on Stipe's side as he was trying to keep his distance, use his like reach against DC. How do you think this fight kind of like played out as it went on? Yeah. So I thought it was an interesting fight from a technical standpoint. So DC for, for pretty much the first three rounds. So I gave him two rounds to one right before they went into the fourth and there was ultimately a knockout. Some people even had it scored three to zero, which I could definitely see the argument for that. And so in my opinion, I think a lot more went wrong for DC than went right for Stipe. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit of what I mean. But so in the early rounds, uh, especially the first, I thought DC was getting the best of the exchanges on feet. So he was he was landing a lot more hits than, than Stipe was. DC was doing this interesting thing where he sort of grabs your gloves and holds his hands out to keep, to keep Stipe from hitting him. 
So every time that Stipe would try to pull his hand, you know, to, to get ready to punch, DC could feel it coming and would be able to use, you know, whether it's head movement or be able to block the punch. DC also was able to get some success in the first round with a big takedown that he had. And Stipe is, is a really athletic heavyweight, so he can move. He was even doing a move that's known as an abyss roll, where uh, it could put you in position possibly to get a, to, you know, get some type of leg lock, whether it's a knee bar, right, or, or an ankle lock, a heel hook. But it's really, really athletic move for a big guy to do. But Stipe is not used to being on the ground like that, and he's not really the best you know, from fighting underneath. And, and so DC got a, got a lot, I think, points in the judges' eyes, right, from, from that big takedown in the first. The second and third rounds, a lot of DC still scoring, scoring a lot, pushing the pace more. And like I said, he was, he was really getting the best of the exchanges. Yeah, now, he got a few good cracks in on Stevie. I noticed that, too, in the second and third rounds. Yeah, which a lot of people were surprised, right? So I was watching this out of Buffalo Wild Wings, and you could hear around, you know, Obviously, there's some people that have never seen DC fight, right? So they're like, oh, that short, chubby, fat guy is going to lose, which he ultimately did, right? But they don't understand how good of a fighter DC is. And so he was getting, he was doing a lot of, a, a lot of damage to Sipe, I thought. Something that was interesting, though, that, that I had thought about is when it comes to DC, because there's such a big height difference with Sipe, so I want to say it's at least four inches, right? And, and there's like an eight-inch reach advantage or something like that. The angle of DC's punches uh, tend to be a little bit higher. So in your general fight where things are completely even, you're the exact same height, your punch goes straight out. So it's about 90 degrees with your body. In DC's case, his punches were going at about 120 degrees, right? So, so it's quite a bit higher than you, you would normally expect. And that's hard to train for. And so your shoulders tend to get a little bit more tired, a lot easier. And that causes your hands to start to drop or be in bad position in the later rounds uh, a lot faster than Stipe, who's throwing more at a natural angle, right? So he's throwing more at that 90 degrees or even a little bit lower. Do you think the DC came into this fight like out of shape? I mean, I definitely think Stipe was in great athletic conditioning in preparation for this fight. Yeah, so no, I don't think DC was out of shape. So DC's, you know, been in five round fights before. This is, he was actually a lot lighter than he was in their last fight. Like I said, a lot of it had to do with the angle of the strikes, right? Having to make up for that reach and height disadvantage. And so doing that does take a little bit more out of you. It takes a little bit more out of your shoulders. They get drained a little bit more. And just naturally, right, like fighting is, fighting is hard. It is tough to go for that long. And so that's ultimately what I think started to come, you know, sort of all cult cultivated together towards that fourth round. And then really... The, the one big thing that went right for, for Steve Bay is he's able to find some luck with a, with a good liver shot, right? So the liver's on the right side of your body. So if you throw a left hook to somebody's body, you're going to be able to hit their liver. And on your typical person, right? So if Steve Bay were to hit me or Eris or you, right, to the liver, we would drop right away. In DC's situation, though, right? So DC's used to taking hits. And a lot of times what you would notice is DC would get hit in the face, He'd come back, he'd do some head movement, but he would still keep progressing forward. In this case, is real subtle, but Stipe hit him with a body shot, and it didn't look like much, but you could see DC, instead of moving forward, he took a step backwards, and it's very subtle. He dropped his elbow to cover up the, that uh, right side of his body, you know, put his elbow down, and that was enough that Stipe knew, hey, you know, I, I think I found that sweet spot. And most people, right, would stick to, to prioritizing trying to get the knockout by hitting him in the head. Stipe instead, though, recognized, hey, I, I hit him in the liver. He, uh, he dropped his elbow. He took a step back. It probably hurt him more than my other shots that he's been just eating in the face, right? And so Stipe, instead of saying, hey, I need to go for the knockout now and just try to punch him in the face, he said, I'm going to go back to the body. And he hit him with another uh, one or two good liver shots. And that's what really opened up DC. Uh, so then you see DC's hands drop, his head is, you know, wide open, head movement's not as quick as it normally is, his foot movement's not as quick as it normally is, and Stipe went to work, and and ultimately, you know, ended up with the with the knockout. Oh yeah, he was really digging in on that, that liver once he found the sweet spot. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of, one fun fact from this fight too, it's had the most significant stripes combined in any heavyweight title bout in the UFC history, 341. In fact, DC had the most ever in a loss 
So these guys were really going to war with each other. It was intense, and that brings me into the next point. Are we going to see this fight again? Many people are speculating this might be DC's last fight. Many people are at wondering if DC wins this one. Does he get that rematch with John? And it's going to be in- interesting. Which trilogy is more likely to get completed? Do you think? How pissed off do you think John Jones is, knowing that he may have lost out on that big payday? What are some of your thoughts regarding the future? Yeah, so I guess what I will say is this fight was definitely in reach for DC, right? You just said the stats. He had the most most significant strikes out of any heavyweight that has lost. And where I think DC really went wrong is he didn't stick to the game plan of wrestling. The dude, you know, is a world medalist in wrestling. He was an Olympic qualifier. He was one of the best heavyweights at Oklahoma State University wrestling for John Smith, right? So the only guy who really kept beating him was Kel Sanderson, who went undefeated in college. And so if DC had just wrestled, you know, rounds four and five, he probably could have grinded out, grinded out the win in this one and wouldn't necessarily be having this conversation. Where I think DC would go, if he's going to take another fight, I think he goes the steep eight route. The reasoning being, first, they're one and one against each other. So DC can say, hey, I've beaten him once. Steve A's beaten me once. I got to get my belt back to prove that I'm truly the best heavyweight of all time. Two, DC can easily claim, hey, I was winning that fight up until, you know, the liver shots came and, and I got knocked out. And had a game plan differently, I probably still could have beat him. So DC has a lot more to claim when it comes to fighting Steve A. When it comes to John Jones, though, right? Like, granted, John Jones was popped for an illegal substance the second time they fought, but it hasn't ever really been close with John Jones. And so if I'm DC, that's not the fight that I take. I definitely take the Stipe fight. And then if you lose twice to Stipe, you could go out, you could retire. People are expecting DC to possibly retire anyways, right? So even if he loses, what's one more loss? You already, you know, if you retire now, you're going out on a loss. If you fight one more time, try to run it back and get the belt back, you lose again. Okay, you lost two out of the three, but you still retire. Still a loss, but you're good on retiring. But you have the possibility to win. Also, I think this the Stipe fight would probably be easier because right now John Jones is in a legal battle with the stripper down here in New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. He, he just got, what, I think it was a battery charge. So that yep. might linger a while. The USC might try to stay away from him. Uh, who knows with that? So the Stipe fight might be the easier fight to, to try to schedule with the UFC anyway. Yeah, exactly, right? So John Jones, he's in a, he's in a current legal battle. I think September 26th is, is his hearing. I'm not sure where they're at in the legal process, but I do know September 26th is that date. So, yeah, I totally agree. Okay, I'm going to close out the UFC 241 talk with one final question. Is Stipe the greatest heavyweight of all time? So I've been going back and forth with people on this, right? I would say right now you have to give it to him, right? Originally, I would have said Daniel Cormier is is the best heavyweight of all time, especially going into the fight. I would have said Daniel Cormier, he's never lost that heavyweight. He's, you know, won two belts. He won light heavyweight, and he won heavyweight. But Stipe just knocked him out. Stipe's also had the most heavyweight defenses uh, of the belt and defending the belt. He was able to win the belt back from Daniel Cormier. Uh, so I think it's hard to argue that Stipe is not the, the best heavyweight of all time. Now, I do know there's some, you know, uh, other fighters from, from other leagues, right? So Fedor Emelianenko, we never got to see him in the UFC. I, I would argue Stipe.